Hare Krishna. Oh, now it's on. Sorry. Oh, okay. Translation. Oh my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudev, O oh, all-pervading personality of Godhead, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute he is the absolute truth and the primeval cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance and destruction of the manifested universe. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations and he is independent because he is because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji, the original living being. By him even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion as one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen in fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of material nature appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. There's still, I'm supposed to finish the third part. <laughs> There's like four pages here of third part. So uh, I will just give the main points. Uh, this verse actually was spoken on by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati for 30 days. And Srila Prabhupada told us he could have spoken more, but <laughs> he was 30, 30. So uh, we're hearing in Prabhupada's purports, he's explaining how the Lord is unique in the sense that he's not just a scientist. You know, scientists, they take credit for creating something. Prabhupada gives the example, water, they make, they get hydrogen and oxygen, put them together and make some water. But who, provide, who provides the elements for them? They take the elements from God. They don't produce the elements themselves. But Krishna is the, the greatest of all scientists because he creates everything from scratch, right? He has to cr produce the elements for the creation and then arrange for the interaction of the different elements to produce everything, to create the phenomenal world. He does everything all by his transcendental potencies. So, Brahma, of course, he's like engineer. He's doing sub-creation. But the original creation is done by the Lord himself. Through his plenary portions, Lord Vishnu, they're able to create everything. So the personality of Godhead is the supreme engineer. And in the, for, in the verse, two words are used, the abhigyana and swarat. Abhigyana swarat, right? Abhigyana swarat. Uh, In the first line, 
Jan-Majjashya-Nyasto-Nabhyaj-Itarachas-Chartesya-Abhigyana-Swarat-Abhigyana-That-He-Is-All-Cognizant-He-Knows-Everything-And-He-Is-Swarat-Also-He-Is-
scientific manner. But the less intelligent, materialistic people, they say, though, there's no God, there's no being, there's no intelligence behind it. But Srila Vyasadeva is describing to us the nature of this personality who is behind the creation. In this first verse, he is offering his obeisances to this Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he invokes the Gayatri Mantra by using the word Dimahi. Janmat yashya yato navayad itaratas chartesu abhigyanaswara tenhi brahma adhikavayi miyantiyat suraya tejo vari mindram yatra vinimayo yatra trisa gomrsha damna swena sadana raskam satyam param dimahi. Right? The last word of the verse, dimahi. This dimahi is from the Gayatri Mantra. And it's a, a very essential part of the Gayatri Mantra. That word, one term, Dimahi, that is very, very essential in the Gayatri Mantra. Srila Vyasadeva does not state the whole Gayatri Mantra, but he simply invokes the Gayatri Mantra by using the one word, Dimahi. And by invoking the Gayatri Mantra, He's also expressing to all of us who are reading the Srimad Bhagavatam the importance of coming to the mode of goodness. Just as if you're going to chant the Gayatri Mantra, you have to be in the mode of goodness. To give the Gayatri Mantra to someone who's in the mode of passion and ignorance is not going to have much effect. But if somebody in the mode of goodness chants the Gayatri Mantra, then they will appreciate, they can feel the benefit, they will feel connection to the Supreme Lord and they can understand the nature of the Lord. The Gayatri Mantra is meant for that purpose that we will know the Lord as the source of all the creation. And this is indicated also in this first verse, where Srila Vyasadeva said, Janmadhyasya nyato navayat, that this whole cosmic manifestation, Janma, Janmad Asya, the, the creation, the maintenance, it's all coming from Him. It's all due to Him. The whole cosmic manifestation comes from Him. And Shankaracharya also accepted that. He also quoted that Janmadhyasya Yatonavayat, that Narayana is beyond the cosmic manifestation. So this, uh, then also Srila Vyasadeva said, Tenhe Brahma Ridaya Adikavaye, that the Vedic knowledge is imparted into the heart of Brahma. Who imparts the Vedic knowledge into the heart of Brahma? Brahma is the firstborn within the universe. Who imparts the Vedic knowledge to him? That one Supreme Lord who is before everyone, who is the cause of the whole cosmic manifestation. And he is the object of the meditation of Brahma. So, by invoking the Gayatri Mantra, Srila Vyasadeva is asserting the position of the Supreme Personality, of the position of Lord Vasudev, that he is the Supreme Lord himself and he should be the object of meditation for everyone. So, this Srimad Bhagavatam is meant for people who have come up to the mode of goodness. Of course, anybody can read Srimad Bhagavatam. Gayatri Mantra is meant to be chanted by those who are pure in the mode of goodness. Anybody can read Srimad Bhagavatam. Gayatri Mantra has to be chanted certain times, certain manner. But Gai Bhagavatam can be chanted, can be read any time, any person. But the effect of reading Bhagavatam will be like the effect of the Gayatri Mantra, that it will bring one 
will purify one's consciousness. One will understand the Supreme Lord behind everything as the cause of the cosmic manifestation and the original source of all knowledge. So, understanding the Lord in these different ways from this first verse, this Abhigyana and Swarat, he knows everything and he's also Swarat, he's independent also. We have some independence. What is the independence of the living entity? Our independence is to choose either Krishna or Maya. Right? That's our independence. We have very limited independence. But the Supreme Lord, He has unlimited independence. He can decide when to create, when to annihilate. Everything is under His direction. He is the Supreme Controller. He is the Param Ishwara, the controller above all other controllers. And He is the Param Satyam. He is the Supreme Truth. And that is why He should be the object of meditation for the living entities. To understand the position of the Supreme Lord is uh, described, although Srila Vyasadeva is describing here in this first verse many characteristics of the Supreme Lord, he will go on to elaborate more. Of course, in the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam, he will present the systematic study of the, of the Lord in just like uh, his, uh, his uh, anatomical form, a, a skeletal form, uh, the first two cantos representing the lotus feet of the Lord, the Pada Padma, and then the third and fourth cantos going on to describe the thighs of the Lord, and going on up to the tenth canto where the, the, the face of the Lord is the tenth canto seeing the actual face of the Lord. So in this way, from the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam, we can come to visualize the Supreme Personality of Godhead through the pages of Bhagavatam. So the Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada said, this is the narration of the Swarup of the Lord. Yeah, it's a nice way to describe it, right? The Swarup. So, we have to hear it from the beginning. So here we are, you know, we're beginning again, Srimad Bhagavatam, from the beginning. We want to hear it from the beginning. Just as when we meditate on the Lord, we begin our meditation from His lotus feet. So the same way, this Srimad Bhagavatam, the first two cantos, represent the lotus feet of the Lord and we gradually, progressively, we come up to see the face of the Lord. Uh, Srila Prabhupada explains how the Lord does not personally take place in the engineering of the cosmic manifestation. He's above that, but it goes on under his direction. Just like a king may be in his palace and he directs his different agents, his different officers to act on his behalf. So the same way the Lord arranges for this cosmic manifestation to take place. People may say, oh, create, Anybody can do that. We create so many things. We create cities, we create big, big buildings, we create wonderful machines, we create spaceships to go into the space. You know, what's so wonderful about your God? What can He do? So we point out that 
Do, you, do we have any scientific creation which can reproduce itself? That is the nature of the Lord's creation, that He creates the living entities and He creates the living entities in such a manner that they can continue to reproduce themselves. We can make motor cars and we can create uh, television stations and so on, but we cannot create something which can reproduce itself. That can only be done by the Supreme Lord. Only He has that kind of power. We want to recognize that unique power of the Supreme Lord. How He, can, he has these inconceivable potencies. He can do things far beyond our comprehension. In the purports here, Srila Prabhupada writes about the most confidential part of the Srimad Bhagavatam and that is the Rasa Lila, which is described in the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So Srila Prabhupada condemns people who will simply rush to the 10th canto Srimad Bhagavatam and particularly they will give importance to the five chapters which describe Krishna's Rasa Lila with the gopis. So Srila Prabhupada explains that these topics should only be heard by those who are fully purified, those who have become Paramahamsas. When we're actually swan-like persons, then we can properly understand these pastimes of the Lord. The Rasa Lila pastimes of the Lord are confidential and they're hidden there. They're only described later on in the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam because without properly understanding the position of the Lord and His transcendental potencies, then one will never be able to understand the nature of the Rasa Lila. So that is very important. Another important point which comes up in Srila Prabhupada's purports here is in relation to the impersonalists. And Prabhupada describes how uh, the impersonalists have encouraged people in mundane sexual activities. Uh, maybe we'll just read from the end of the purport here. Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur specifically deals with the original and pure sex psychology, Ras, devoid of all mundane inebriety. The whole material creation is moving under the principle of sex life. In modern civilization, sex life is the focal point for all activities. <laughs> this, this point was brought up. Uh, Srila Prabhupada was attending Rathi Atra in New York. And he was sitting on the chariot going down Fifth Avenue. And he called over one of his recently initiated sannyasis, a devotee called Triparari Swami. Triparari Swami was a young American man who had had great success in distributing Prabhupada's literature. And he took sannyas at a very early age. I think he was in his 20s, late 20s, when he took sannyas. And uh, Prabhupada called him over and he said to him, he said, what, what, what do you think of these women here? <laughs> what do you think of these women, these New York women? You know, in Tripurari, you know, he just taken sannyas a little while ago. He thinks, oh, well, Prabhupada must be testing me. <laughs> See what I'm thinking of. 
But Prabhupada went on to explain to him, he said, he said, he said, oh look, he said, look at these women, he said, you know, they're so, aren't they all, they're so beautiful, you know, they're all so beautiful. And you can see, because of all these beautiful women, that this whole Manhattan, you know, Manhattan, a jungle of skyscrapers everywhere, skyscraper. He said, this whole Manhattan is going on because of them. <laughs> it is all based on the attraction between the men and these, the men and these women. That the women are very beautiful, the men are, are very attracted to these women, and that's why you have this whole big city, this whole metropolis called Manhattan, New York City. Just skyscrapers from beginning to end. So, <laughs> so this, this point is here in Srimad Bhagavatam, how everybody in the material world, they're so absorbed, they're so occupied under the principle of sex. Prabhupada continues, wherever one turns his face, he sees sex life predominant. Therefore, sex life is not unreal. Its reality is experienced in the spiritual world. So, Prabhupada recognizes sex life is a very real thing. But, Prabhupada is making the point that the reality is in the spiritual world. That what people are thinking is a reality is simply the illusion of the material world. And certainly you can see the material world, how the, the whole business, big cities, they're all centered around that principle. Sex life, nightclubs, casinos, bars, all of these things, it's all based on the body. So many shops, are all de all the shops are catering for the hair and for the skin. These things, it, and why? Because it's all concerned about the sex the sex urge. So this sex urge is real and it's actually there in the spiritual world. But in the spiritual world it is without the inhibrities of the material world. We see the problems in the material world. That because of sex life there is so much divorce, there are so many crimes, there are so many sinful activities perpetrated, all based on the sex principle. If there was no sex, the world would be a very different place. Just imagine how the world would be. So, in the spiritual world, however, there is sex. But it is very pure. We have to understand. Of course, very difficult for us to understand due to our conditioned nature. Because we are so much conditioned, we're so much influenced by this materialistic society which we've been brought up in. It is hard for us to think there could be such a thing as pure sex psychology. Srila Prabhupada explains more. The material sex life is but a perverted reflection of the original fact. The original fact is the absolute truth. And thus the absolute truth cannot be impersonal. It is not possible to be impersonal and contain pure sex life. Consequently, the impersonalist philosophers have given indirect import, impetus to the abominable mundane sex life because they have overstressed the impersonality 
of the absolute truth. So Prabhupada recognizes the problem that he said a lot of the blame has to go to these impersonalists who propagated this impersonal philosophy that ultimately the absolute truth is impersonal without any personality, without any features and qualities, just simply oneness. So that, and because of that, people think that sex in the material world is the real thing. They do not understand. It is simply the illusion, just simply the maya. But they're thinking it to be reality. So the impersonalists have to take a lot of blame. They do not recognize the absolute truth as being personal. The pure form of the sex, ras, adi ras, is there in the spiritual world. Prabhupada continues, Consequently, man, without information of the actual spiritual form of sex, has accepted perverted material sex life as the all in all. There is a distinction between sex life in the diseased material condition and spiritual sex life. There is a big difference the diseased material sex life and the spiritual sex life. People are not educated. The whole problem is spiritual education. Often it's a wrong education that's worse. If people are given the impersonal teachings of the Absolute, that's worse because it simply encourages people in their gross sensual activities because they think ultimately there's no activity. So th this Bhagavatam fulfills the need in human society that people are lacking spiritual education. As Prabhupada, or, or, as Srila Vyasadeva will go on to describe later uh, when uh, Srila Narada Muni is teaching Vyasadeva, it is described that uh, this top, these topics of the Srimad Bhagavatam can bring about a revolution in the impious lives of the world's misdirected civilization. Such words, though, though they may be imperfectly composed, are heard, sung and accepted by men who are thoroughly honest. So Srimad Bhagavatam, we said, you have to be really, you have to come to the mode of goodness to understand it, to relish it, to appreciate the value of it. That is why the Gayatri Mantra was invoked in the beginning there. Just to read the end of the purport. This, this Srimad Bhagavatam will gradually elevate the, un the unbiased reader to the highest perfectional stage of transcendence. It will enable him to transcend the three modes of material nature, fruit of activities, speculative philosophy, and worship of functional deities as inculcated in Vedic verses. So Srimad Bhagavatam is giving the highest education beyond all of these things of the three modes of material nature. We know in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna tells Arjuna, Trigunya Vishaya Veda, nice Trigunya Baba Arjuna. Rise above the modes, O Arjuna. The, the Vedic literatures deal with the subject matter of the modes of nature 
rise above these modes, O Arjuna. And so he and also the Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada is explaining how by reading and studying the Srimad Bhagavatam, we will transcend the three modes of material nature. And Prabhupada goes on to describe what happens when you're still in the three modes of material nature, the fruit of activity, where we want to enjoy the results of the work, speculative philosophy, maybe there's a tendency to think about liberation, and uh, worship of functional deities. All these different traditions which are there, which are very much part of the material world, which are really under the modes of nature. The different functional deities, some deities influenced by the mode of passion, some by the mode of ignorance even. But Srimad Bhagavatam will help us to transcend all of these things, to come to the highest level of, of transcendence. This is the Srimad Bhagavatam, the supreme occupation, the Paradharma, right? The, we want to be able to distinguish reality from illusion. We are thinking this material world to be reality. Of course, it is real, but it is temporary. It is, it is temporary, but a temporary man, manifestation. The Mayavadas, Mayavadi philosophy, they say Brahman Satyam Jagat Mitya, that this world is all false, that only the Brahman is true. But we learn from the Srimad Bhagavatam that this material world is also part of the Lord's creation, but it is the inferior energy of the Lord. It is the external potency of the Lord. It is not the superior, it's not the supreme feature of the Lord. Jiva Goswami gives an example about the blind man had some gold. So someone asked him, is it how do you know it's gold? You're blind. He said, oh, another blind man gave me it. Another blind man told me it's gold. He said, oh, he's blind. How does he know it's gold? Um, he knows because another blind man told him it was gold. So like that, you, <laughs> you, you want to see the truth. You cannot just sim simply go to a blind person. You have to find somebody who has eyes who can actually see. So this is the point. Srimad Bhagavatam is for open, it has a purpose to open our eyes to see the reality distinguished from illusion. That there is so much illusion in the material world. People are all generally in the bodily concept of life. That is the number one illusion thinking, I am the body. They don't understand that within the body is the eternal spiritual particle. They have no education. But this Srimad Bhagavatam is meant to help people to open their eyes. Just like we pray, Om Agyana Timarandasya. I was born in the darkest ignorance. But my spiritual master opened my eyes with the lamp of knowledge. So the Srimad Bhagavatam, this is that lamp, this is that lamp of knowledge that, which can open our eyes. Actually, the Srimad Bhagavatam is more than just the lamp of knowledge. The Srimad Bhagavatam is the literary incarnation of the Lord. That we will see as we go, as we read. Uh, in this first chapter, there are questions by the sages. And one of the questions was, now that Lord Krishna has departed from the world, where are all the religious principles to be found? 
the sages said that we knew that so long as Lord Krishna was present on the planet, he was the form, he was the personification of all religious principles. But now that he has left this world, where are the religious principles to be found? And this resulted in Sutta Goswami saying, Krishna Swadamo Pagate Dharma Jnana Dibhisaha Kalo Nishtam Drishanesha Puranarto Drinodhritaha That this Bhagavad Purana is as brilliant as the sun and it has arisen just after the departure of Lord Krishna for his own abode. Persons who have lost their vision due to the dense darkness of this age of Kali will get light from this Purana. So this is the very special contribution of the Srimad Bhagavatam. That it will help us to overcome the darkness of this age of Kali. We're all affected by the influence of the age of Kali. The nature of this Kali Yuga is so inauspicious so irreligious. Srila Vyasadeva describes people in the Kali Yuga, Manda Sumanda Matayo, Manda Bhagya Hi Padruta, Prayena Payasasha Vyakalovas Minyugajana, Manda Sumanda Matayo, Manda Bhagya Hi Padruta. Persons in this age of Kali are certainly, will have a short life. We're not going to live very long. We've got things like coronavirus coming along to make sure you don't live very long, right? Shouldn't live too long. All the elderly people quickly die. <laughs> not only do we live a short life, but we are lazy, we are misguided, we are unlucky, and above all, we are always disturbed. We don't have peace of mind. We don't have, we have no good qualities in Kali Yuga. But if we hear the Srimad Bhagavatam, if we take, put some time, put some effort into studying the Srimad Bhagavatam, then we can get great benefit, great, the greatest benefit. Benefit means we can be freed from birth and death. It can take us out from this material world, from this ugly samsar, this wheel of birth and death, causing us to take birth again and again in the material world. So this is the power of Srimad Bhagavatam. Srila Prabhupada also writes that simply by reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna is there on the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam. That we can actually see Krishna. We want to see God? Read Srimad Bhagavatam. You can see him in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. So many people say, I want to see him. Okay, read Srimad Bhagavatam. The Lord is there. But you have to read with quality. You have to read with attention. We have to read with devotion. Then the Lord will appear. He's there within the pages of the Bhagavatam. So, uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam is the, the graduate study. Bhagavad Gita is primary school. Bhagavad Gita concludes with Lord Krishna saying, give up all material religion and surrender unto me. So then Srimad Bhagavatam takes us from that point that if we have surrendered to Krishna, then we can go on from that point. Then we're, we can come to hear, now hear about Krishna. The Srimad Bhagavad Gita was Krishna speaking himself. 
Srimad Bhagavatam, we're going to hear about Krishna through the pen of Vyasadeva. And he's going to describe for us how the Lord manifests in so many different features, his different incarnations, his different avatars, his different energies. He will describe the creation. You want to know how this world came about? It's all described very scientifically, very detailed. We don't get that kind of information in any other religious tradition. If you read the Bible, we read that God created the world in seven days. But you're not told how he did it. There's no information. But in Srimad Bhagavatam, everything is described step by step. So in this way, the first verse is Srila Vyasadeva. The first three verses are the invocation to the Srimad Bhagavatam. And the first verse is Srila Vyasadeva offering his obeisances to the Supreme Personality of God. Any comments, Janani Prabhu? Okay. One point. Uh, why do people, why are people often unable to distinguish the reality from the illusion because why cannot they understand this world is simply the illusion it's not it's not eternal it's not real that shows in itself that there is a real world beyond this world the fact that we have the desire to want something, to want to have an eternal relationship, to enjoy forever, that is natural. Because that's the nature of the spiritual world. But we're trying to find this reality in the wrong place. That is the defect of the conditioned souls. That we're looking for the reality in the material world. You want the real thing? You have to go to the spiritual world. We have to transcend, we have to get out from this material world. So Srimad Bhagavatam helps us. It's a vehicle to transport us out of this material world. Okay, Hare Krishna, Srimad Bhagavatam ki cha. Srila Prabhupada ki. Lord Chaitanya. But two. But Why did he read Dhruva and Prahlad Maharaj? What was the why was he so attracted to Dhruva and Prahlad? Because, of, because they were so young, young children, and they became Krishna conscious. So it's so inspiring to hear that. <laughs> yeah.
Hmm. Yeah, Lord Chaitanya didn't worry so much about hearing Rasa Lila. He liked to hear about Dhruva and Prahlad. And did he also hear Rasa Lila? With Raman and the You would hear more, that would be more from Gop, Gopi, Gita Govinda. You'd hear the Gita Govinda. Of course, he, he was conversant with the whole, the whole Bhagavatam. But he took special pleasure in hearing about Dhruva and Prahlad. Maybe. Well, that was from Gadarha, right? When Gadarha would read, you'd like Gadarha to read. He also spoke Bhagavatam. Oh, in a Bhagavatam class. Oh. <laughs> But it wasn't like a public thing. Sankirtan was public. Maybe just for his intimate circle of devotees. Where would they have the class? At the Toda Gopinath temple? Mahaprabhu's house. That was the ad hoc Sajjadithi, was it? So then he gave it to Gadarha to worship? Oh yeah, she has Krishna Bhavana. Yeah. 
mentions she how she had Krishna Balaram, but but we always hear that that Hoksa deity was Jagannath Mishra's deity, right? They say that deity which was found at the Yoga Peep, that that was the deity of Jagannath Mishra. Maybe they had several deities. They say Lord Chaitanya actually discovered that deity of Tota Gopinath in, in Puri. Tota Gopinath, the Tota Gopinath deity was discovered by Lord Chaitanya 